jump into our time together, uh, I want to make an announcement, which is pretty exciting, uh, that right now, in this room, my abuela and my abuelo are here. <laughs> Woo! Look at that woman. Look at it. She stood up. Oh, hey! She stood up. Hey! <laughs> I didn't tell. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so, so if you couldn't tell, I'm Cuban, and uh, and when you preach, your abuela comes out, and so uh, and she stands. Uh, but before, <laughs> that is so funny. You stood up, abuela. Uh, but before we uh, before we jump in, uh, for the past going, this is actually six weeks now. We have been in a series called Mighty. And uh, in this series, what we have been focusing on is, is how, as parents, do we raise children that are mighty? And how do we focus on helping our children become people who love God, people who don't resent God, people who not just love us as parents, but also love their creator? And I know, for many of us parents, um, you almost need to hear something that's really obvious at this time. And, um, and I know I'm going to say it, and you guys are going to be like, yeah, that's obvious, but it has to be said before we jump into the discussion that we're going to have today. Here it is. Are you ready? Parenting is hard. Oh, is it hard? <laughs> and it is so, so hard. Like, I'm talking about so hard that you can't think hard. Like, so hard that you almost feel it in your heart. It's so hard when you lay in bed, you hear them yelling, ah! You're just like, oh, this is so hard. And it almost feels as if everything is, and parenting is hard. And even this past Thanksgiving, my son, my youngest, was just going crazy throughout Thanksgiving, letting his presence be known. And I'm holding him, and I say to this one guy, yeah, we're just in a hard season right now with our kids. He's like, hey, put your kid down. And I'm like, what? And he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, every season's hard. <laughs> and, and, so, and so it's hard. And, and the, the encouraging thing is that you are not alone in that. You are not the only parent to struggle to get your kids to eat more than just macaroni and cheese and ketchup. You're not the only parent to, to, to just hope and pray that one day your kid will come out of the house, put the video games down, and come and get some sun on their face. You're not the only parent of an adult child with a beard and armpit hair hanging out of this shirt, still living in your house, and you're trying to get them out. You are not alone in how hard this is. And if you believe that parenting is hard, you are in good company. See, because when you study the scriptures and when you read the Bible and you read all these examples of these godly people, so godly that God said, I'm going to put you in the Bible. That's a big deal. And you read their examples and you read their struggles as parents and you see that parenting is hard. See, King David wrote most of the Psalms. King David killed a lion with his hands, right? He took a rock and killed a giant with a rock. Like King David, a warrior, a poet. Ooh, okay, macho, right? Strong and yet soft, right? <laughs> King of Israel. And yet one of his sons tried to murder him at one point to take away his kingdom. Parenting's hard. And, and I want you guys to be encouraged before we jump into this lesson today, uh, because this conversation is going to be challenging. And last service, a lot of parents are like, oh, man, I don't know if I'll say thank you or to say, get away from me. <laughs> um, but as a brother in Christ, I'm right next to you, and I'm limping too. All parents, we're all limping. We're all struggling. We're all frustrated. We're all dealing with impatience, whatever season it is, we're all trying to figure this out. And as a brother in Christ, I'm right next to you. So I'm not come, I didn't come down from a mountain to tell you how to be perfect parents because I am. If anything, I came from among you and said, hey, look, I read this book. <laughs> Let's talk about it. All right, so let me pray for us before we jump into this. Um, God, thank you so much for the way that you love us. Thank you for the way that you are so good. Oh, you're just so good. You're just so kind, and you're so loving, and you're so involved, and you're so just good. And God, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're good. And, um, and Lord, forgive us for the times that we allow circumstances in our lives to be what we use to define who you are. Um, you are a good dad to us. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the example that we have in you. We thank you for the joy that we can have in you. 
So Lord, I pray that as we cover this material, as we break down what it means to protect our children, God, can you please give us some wisdom? Can you please give us some strength? Can you please, Lord, give us some patience and insights and how we can help our children see you as good? God, please help us. Allow for the word to be made clear. Allow for the gospel to be something that we value even more. And allow for us to have fun together. Allow us to laugh. Allow us to be, this to be a time that we leave here enjoying and yet still challenged by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I am the poppy of two boys. And sometimes it feels like four. Uh, <laughs> and my boys are incredible. And there was something that happened when my oldest son, Angel Garcia IV, when he was born, something inside of me was ignited that honestly no one prepared me for this, no one told me this would happen, but there was almost like this, this spark of, like, of an instinct of like, I gotta do everything to protect this kid. Like it was the weirdest thing, and to this day, I mean, now with my youngest Xander, and my wife makes fun of me about this all the time, just how exaggerated I am with protecting my kids physically. Like I'm the kind of dad that when I'm in the mall, I'm like, Who's here? Who's here? I'm talking to the security guy. Hey, you got any calls today? Anything happened today? What's going on? What's going on? And, um, and, but when my wife's not around, it's almost heightened 10 times because not only am I scared something's going to happen to my kids, I'm scared what's going to happen to me if something happens to my kids <laughs> and, my wife's not around, and my wife finds out. So a few weeks ago, we went to uh, C.B. Smith Park, not too far from here, and we're at C.B. Smith, and I had just my boys, and my wife was gone. So literally, I left my phone in the car. I'm like, no distractions. I'm on duty right now. It's time to go. I even had, like, my workout shoes on to make sure if things popped off, I can run and jump, and I can protect my children. And so we go into C.B. Smith, and we're there playing and, and having a great time. And all the parents there, there was a bunch of dads, too, which there might have been something going on where all these dads had to take their kids to the park. And I'm there with all these dads, and we're working together, like, doing everything to keep our kids from having to go to the ER or a police station. And, <laughs> and we're, we're working, grinding, and then all of a sudden, from the side of my peripheral vision, I see a man walking. And then I see he has no kids. And then he walks into the park. And then he sits on a bench in a park of children. And he's got no kids. Red flags all over the place. All the parents, what's happening? What's happening? And immediately, eyes locked on this man. I'm watching him like this, ready to sprint and drop some WCW moves and cracking ankles and cracking toes and making things felt. And I'm ready, and I'm, I'm on him. And then all of a sudden, as I'm watching him, he was to my right. I'm watching him from across the park, just waiting. And this poor guy, he's probably just trying to enjoy a day in the park. He's probably trying to get away from his kids. He's probably, like, who knows what this man's trying to do? <laughs> he's, he, he was not in it. Like, he didn't have a shirt that said anything creepy. He was just a normal guy. If anything, he looked more normal than I do. <laughs> and he just sits down on the bench. He's on his phone, minding his business, thinking about life. And I'm thinking, boy, you better not get up too fast. And, and I look to my left, or to which, as you're right, and I look to my left, and I see another dad. This is exactly what he does to me. It's so funny. He goes. <laughs> and he starts coming around the park like this. And I'm feeling like, are we, are we here to get Obama? Like, like, I mean, Bin Laden? Like, what's happening? Like, it's some mission. Like, we're trying to, like, he's there coming behind the slide and watching. And I'm on the other side like, yeah, we got you. Surrounded, bro. And, uh, and the guy just stood up and went on his way, kept going on his walk, having his time with the Lord, whatever he was doing. But in the heart of a parent, oh, it was so intense. I mean, even before my kids were born. When my kid, before my kids were born, the, the doorbell would ring, and we weren't expecting somebody. All of a sudden, doo ding, and I would get up like, oh, my gosh, someone's here, babe. Someone's come to our house. <laughs> this is so exciting. Play some music. Put Celia Cluse on. We need to have enjoy and welcome them. Bring out some leftovers. Oh, my gosh, someone's here. I would open the door, just swing it open. I wouldn't even look. Someone's here. Now? Someone rings my doorbell and I got two kids, I become a lunatic. If any of you come to my house unannounced, you will hear me say, Kate, grab the kids, take them to the back, hide them under the cushions. I'm gonna, it's gonna be five minutes. If it's more than five minutes, call the cops. Don't even come. I open the door just enough to be able to say, Who are you? 
What do you want? Because there's something so deep inside of us that is just like, man, whatever it takes, I'm going to protect my kids. Like, man, when you talk to a dad of a daughter, oh my gosh, when you talk to a dad of a daughter, it's almost scary, right? When they're just, oh, anything. I train six hours a week envisioning a boy coming to my house and doing something, right? Like, it's this intensity. We have weapons, security system, cameras in every angle, camera in the mailbox. Like, it is just like, my family, protection. And you know what? You are right. You, we, as parents, have every right to be this way. I went to Pember Pines Mall the other day. Boy, head on a swivel. Where you at? I know there's somebody with bad plans here. <laughs> and we're right. It's scary out there, man. And our kids, man, they deserve our protection. Man, they deserve us saying, man, I'm going to do 100 push-ups every night to protect my kids. Man, they deserve us to be able to walk into a room and think, how do I keep my kids safe if something happens? Your kids are worth it. And they really are. But the problem is, as parents, we stop there. We just protect physical. We just protect them from physical dangers. But we don't contemplate that there's so much more that we as parents need to be thinking about and caring for our children in. And I know when you hear me say that, the fact that we should be protecting our children spiritually Right off the bat, you're all thinking, oh, this is going to tell me about canceling their Instagram, putting everything on, like uh, the world's sinful, run, uh, go put up gates, run, run, run. And maybe, <laughs> but there's going to be a little bit more in this. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab that note card I put in front of you. Well, I didn't put it. One of our amazing volunteers did. Grab that note card, and I want you to actually put it in the air. And I want you to just quickly wave it like you just don't care. Hey, all right, that's beautiful. Now, this, uh, this note card is going to be very helpful for our discussion because we have been looking in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we have been breaking down a passage of scripture that is literally spoken to specifically just parents. Like this is when God says, parents, listen up. And it's so important. And what we've been doing as a church for the past six weeks, which is so awesome. And I just love that as a church we've been doing this. We have been tiptoeing our way through this passage. This wasn't just a drive-by, hey, look, parents, be good. Later, come back next Sunday. This has been tiptoeing, verse by verse, dissecting this passage and seeking to put tools in your hands to help you, well, actually, to help us, because I'm in this with you, raise our children to know God, to love them. See, because as parents... We need to understand that our role is not to just protect them physically, but to protect them spiritually. And in our conversation, we're going to break down three different ways that we protect our children spiritually. But let's go ahead and look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 to get a good understanding of what we have come to to this point. Uh, so if you have a Bible, please open it to Deuteronomy chapter 6, looking at verse 4, and we're going to go to verse 9. Verse 9 is what all of our conversation is going to be about. I'm going to read verse 9, and you're going to be like, what? And it will make sense later. Let's just read verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words I command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when your children lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, you shall, and, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Here's verse nine. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, when you read verse nine, it's very easy to just think the obvious, right? This is just telling us, grab some Bible verses, tape them on top of your door, tape them on your mailbox, boom, we're good. But what this passage is telling us is a little bit more, more rich than just tape things all over the front of your house. This passage is causing us as parents to have to reevaluate. Verse 9 is causing us to relook at how, what do we consider protection? 
when we think of our children. See, because the interesting thing about this passage is it's telling us, have protection on your gates. Consider what's from a distance. And then he's telling us, now also consider what is up close. And we're going to be spending time really evaluating, okay, what is that distance and what is up close to our children that we must fight to protect them from? And this conversation is not going to be just about phones. It's going to be about so much more. So I really want you to listen. Because what we have been learning for the past six weeks is basically what this passage teaches is how this style of parenting, what it's telling us here to love our children, to care for our children, to be present with our children, to literally mirror what God has done with us. And when we come to this conversation of protection, you can't really understand what it means to protect your child spiritually unless you understand the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. The fact that God saw a spiritual need in the world, that God saw separation between himself and the world. The fact that God saw that the world was left to itself, open to all spiritual attacks. That man was not able to save himself, that man could not earn forgiveness. The fact that God saw this, and he didn't turn a blind eye. He didn't just look away. He didn't just say, they'll figure it out. But God steps in. He steps into the world. And he doesn't step into the world to become famous. He doesn't step into the world because it's the right thing to do. He steps into the world to create a way of spiritual protection. And Jesus in his goodness, Jesus in his kindness, Jesus in all the good that he is, he goes and marches up the mountain carrying his cross experiencing horrible torture, and then while hanging on the cross, experiencing division amongst the Trinity, where he yells out at one point, Father, you have forsaken me for the cause of establishing spiritual protection for myself, for you, for the cause of establishing forgiveness for you, for me. Jesus faced discomfort so that I can have comfort. And when I look at the cross, I see a God who's willing to go and do whatever it takes to rescue his children. Parents, when you look at the cross, my heart for you would be to say, man, I must do whatever it takes to protect my children spiritually. Some of us already got physically done. But what about their soul? So, something just broke. All right. <laughs> man, I, I know Roby's going to come back and be like, man, what happened? Angel preached and he broke the stage. He's, why wouldn't that happen? But before we jump into this and as we figure out the screens and everything, don't let that just distract you completely, um, even though it can. Um, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to start walking our way through these, through these points uh, because I think it's so helpful for us to establish a healthy understanding for what it means to protect our children spiritually. And Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13, if you, if you have a Bible, please open it because our projectors aren't working. Uh, if, or turn your Bible on so you can see this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 13. Let me read this for us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be ready to withstand the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all stand Firm. See, the first thing we're going to be talking about is how we as parents need to fight to protect our children from the sin of the world. And this one's almost like the obvious one. Like when we think of our culture, when we think of our world, when we think of the, what's surrounding our children, no one's like, oh man, it's all wholesome and pure. Woo! I go on Facebook during political seasons and man, so much love. <laughs> no! Like, we get it. 
It's toxic out there. But in our laziness as parents, but in our passiveness, we just let it just attack our children. And we let it just flood like an avalanche into our child's life. And because we're scared of conflict with our child as cowards, we just allow for things to just literally flow and consume who they are. But if you're a parent, you must be willing to protect your child, not just physically, but spiritually. And so what I try to do is I try to give you guys some, some practical tools. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is not all the tools. And that's what's more, most encouraging to me, that there are thousands of different tools that we have as parents to be able to fight and protect our children from the sin that just flows from our culture into our lives. And so one of the first ones is phones, right? Ooh, man, I love when I get to talk to teen, uh, middle school parents about phones. They always like, did you know that a phone gives them access to the world? Yeah, yeah I've heard, man. Yeah. <laughs> like they can see anything. I know, it's, it's wild. Now, there's this really cool app. It's called Screen Time. And this is super interesting because what it does is, is basically you pay a fee every year. I get no money for telling you about this. But you get, it's basically about like 40 bucks a year. And it gives you complete access to controlling your child's phone. Man, your child just got so angry at me right now. <laughs> I, just, I just saw, Why, what are you doing, man? <laughs> but here's the truth. It's really cool because you go on this app and you can literally control how much time they spend on YouTube, what kind of videos they watch. Man, a, a teenager just went, tch, 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 right? <laughs> you can literally control how much time they spend on social media, you can control what kind of pictures get saved, what kind of websites get looked at. Like you literally have their phone on your phone. That's incredible. Not for your students. They're really angry at me right now. I can feel it. But, and so like, let's look at movies, right? Movies is another category. And, and just to kind of give you the perspective of this, when it comes to Super Bowl commercials, in Super Bowl commercials, they spend, Coca-Cola or Pepsi will spend at least about millions of dollars to give you a 30 second commercial about their dirty looking water filled with sugar. And, and now we'll watch this 30 second commercial and be like, I gotta go drink this thing I know is bad for me. <laughs> I can't wait. And Coca-Cola and Pepsi know that they can get your attention for 30 seconds. They can get you to buy anything. And they'll spend millions for that. Now, if that's what 30 seconds can do, what can a two hour movie do? Now, as parents, being able to, you don't, who has time to watch every movie that our child and teenager watches? None, but somebody does. <laughs> and there's a guy, there's a group of people who, who have this website called plugin.com, and you just go on this website completely free, and you go into the search, and you type in whatever movie you want to watch on Netflix, movie theaters, wherever it is, and it gives you a breakdown of the entire movie, positive elements, negative elements, sexual content that gives you basically how, what words are being used. They'll say like the, the S word was said six times and it breaks down the script of the movie. So as a parent, you can be like, oh, you want to watch that movie? Perate. And you'll get on your phone and you'll be like, uh, actually, uh, no, you're not watching it. But you get to know what they're going about to sit in front of for two hours. And it's free. So at worst, it just takes you 10 minutes to know what your child's about to sit under. Now, let's just scroll down to the YouTube resources because I know for a lot of parents, we, um, and even grandparents, when you got your kids sometime or your grandkids are in your house trashing the place and you're sitting there like, what do I do? Pop some YouTube on and here's what happens, okay? Or maybe you're a parent of a teenager and your teen's asking all these questions about God and you're just sitting there like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, I don't know what that means. Here's the greatest thing that you can do with your teen. Learn with your teen. Just learn with them. Say, I don't know. Let's know together. And so on YouTube, there's this amazing resource that we're actually going to start using here in our student ministry called Alpha. It's an Alpha Youth Series, and it's an 11-week series that basically there's, there's, um, there's these 30-minute videos that take a, a, a question about God that teenagers are asking, 
and then breaks it down throughout the entire 30 minute video. And he even has breaks in it so that you can have time to discuss with your child. We're gonna start doing this here, but how much more effective would it be if a parent does it with their teen? And it's free, completely free. Instead of just sitting there like, what do you wanna watch today? I don't know what we wanna watch today. Google what to watch today. Let's watch Alpha Series and learn about who God is and answer some of those questions you have. Super engaging, super helpful material, and it points them to who Jesus is because you're protecting them spiritually. And now if you have little children, little children is like, man, so for me as a parent, I'm gonna be honest, when I read to my children, they hate it. I am not fun when I read. I'm like stuttering over words. I'm trying to figure out, oh, look at the picture, son. Right, like it's just, I'm terrible at reading aloud to my kids. And what makes it even worse is that my wife is amazing at it. Like she's wearing costumes and, and she has puppets and they're like jumping off stuff and it's beautiful time. And they come in, all right, let's read. <laughs> Completely unhelpful. And so as a, really as a flaw in my parenting, I have just said, I'm not gonna do it. I'm terrible at it, so let's just not do it. Instead of saying, let me figure out another way. And so a few weeks ago, I came across, right there on your, one of the resources, I came across a storybook Bible. It's on YouTube. And what they do is they take every single lesson, chop it up into six minutes, engaging videos with like a voice like Morgan Freeman going over it. And I just sit there with my little baby boys and like, all right, let's watch this. Your, dad, your dad's terrible reading out loud? Let's watch this video. I can do that. And we can talk about it. Because as a dad, as a Bobby, as a spiritual protector of my children, I have to do whatever it takes. Now, I think um, what's interesting about this passage, Deuteronomy 6 verse 9, is that he's telling us, hey, put it on your gates. Be mindful of the things that are from a distance. And then he's telling us, put it on the doorpost. Be mindful of what's up close. So as we transition to our next point, I want you to turn your paper over, turn it over, and let me read for you guys Jeremiah. Let me read for you Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We get so caught up with just the obvious answer of protecting our children from the sin of the world. Pulling our kids out of school, doing all this crazy stuff. Get, get, get them in the house. Get them in the house. Get them away from everything. Protect from the sin of the world. Which you're right. But then we stop there. This passage just told us that the heart of your child is deceitful. The heart of your child is desperately sick, just like yours. Did you know that your children struggle to believe that God really loves them? Did you know that your children are insecure and believe lies about themselves, that they tell themselves? In many cases, your children's greatest attacker is themselves. And so as parents seeking to protect our children spiritually and physically, we must be willing to protect them from themselves. This passage is so clear to what's taking place in the heart of your child. And they're lying to themselves. They're believing the worst about themselves. And as parents, this is serious. If I walked into a room and I saw somebody inflicting physical harm on my children, would any of you judge me from inflicting physical harm on them? You'd be like, go get them, boy, yeah, yeah. But when I walk into a room and my son's inflicting emotional harm on himself of stuff he believes, or, my, or your daughter saying lies to herself. Why do you just close the door and let them figure it out on their own? In a lot of cases, your child's greatest attacker is themselves. 
And so this is something, this is a conversation that we could literally do a four-hour training on. And we can actually even do a whole series on just how to help our, t- our children, our teens, our young adults, how to help them be protecting from themselves. So I thought, man, instead of doing a four-hour training, because we have some Thanksgiving leftovers we have to go eat, I wanted to give us just, if I could only give two things, two tools to use in, in this fight of protecting our children from themselves, here they are. Number one, encouragement encouragement and that sounds so basic and that sounds like so like level one but it's so true no one says more lies to your children than they say to themselves your children stand in the mirror and pick themselves apart your children look at their report cards and just trash themselves your children stay on social media and just put all these lies onto themselves and as parents We must be the ones who are protecting them from themselves by covering them in encouragement, almost showering them in encouragement. There cannot be enough encouragement that you give to your children, to your teens, and to your young adults. No one has ever gone to counseling because my dad just encourages me way too much. Oh man, my mom, she just encourages me all the time. It's terrible. That doesn't happen. Let me give you an example of what happened earlier this week. I was, my, my oldest son, he, his belief is that in life, he has to be the fastest person in the world. He's got to be faster than Lightning McQueen. He's got to be faster than anybody. He even puts his hair, he combs it back in a way so he can be super fast. That's what he says. He even wears clothes and he says, Bapi, is this fast clothes? Yeah, Bapu, it's fast. Now be quiet, get in the car. All right? He, his shoes, they got to be fast. He eats, it's got to be fast. Everything's speed, Right? Well, he was at the park earlier this week, and the little boy came up to him and said, let's race. And he said, oh, boy, I've been waiting for this. Let's race. So they race. The little boy crushed him, left him in the dirt. And my son was destroyed. Falls on the ground, throws his shoes off. I'm not fast, right? My wife's trying to get him to calm down. I'm not fast all day long. I'm not fast. He gets in his, in his chair. I'm not fast. Completely deflated, deflated. We're sitting down for dinner. I'm not fast. We're saying, all right, let's pray for the food. No, God didn't make me fast, right? And it's this whole like defeat. I am not fast. So then right before bed, I go give him a little besito right before he goes to bed. And I say, all right, Papa, good night. And he says, Papi, we need a train so I can get faster and beat everybody. And as a dad, I'm saying, like, yeah, yeah, we're going to train. Garcia boys, yeah. I'm going to get a tree. You're going to carry it on your back, and you're going to run with it like in Rocky. This is going to be awesome. And I come out, and I tell my wife, hey, Kate, listen up. We're training, and he's going to crush that little boy, Kate. And he's going to crush all of the boys. Get ready for the Olympics, girl. We're reorientating our whole family. <laughs> and my wife, who is really smart, she looked at me and she says, don't you see what's happening? Our little son's having an identity crisis. He believes his value is a, is a result of his speed. Let's not encourage that. Let's encourage him out of that. I was like, hey, hold up, girl. <laughs> I'm the pastor in this house, and <laughs> you're not going to be doing all that on me. I went to college for this stuff. I'm actually, I'm preaching a sermon on Sunday about this, all right? But she was so right. And instead of being the dad who comes in the room and, and kind of encourages a lie that he is believing and having a fit because that his value is based on his speed, I had to be a dad who protected him spiritually from himself. And I had to be a dad who, before we did our two hours of practice, which was the cutest thing in the world, I had to sit him down and say, look, son, let's talk about really what matters. Let's talk about how you matter, not because of your speed. And we had this whole beautiful conversation where I just poured myself into it, and his response was, okay, cool, let's train. (laughs) But what was done in that moment was, I fought against this habit that we as parents have, that we all, we, we're all in this, this habit of being able, of saying, I'm just going to just avoid that. I'm not going to capture the lies that my child's listening to. I'm not going to address the lies that they're listening to. I'm not going to fight those lies. 
And in my household, we're fighting lies. In my household, I'm going to fight a lie just like I'll fight someone who breaks in my home. This is serious. Because that little boy, when he becomes 16 years old, and if he had a dad who just looked the other way, unlike God does, if he had a dad who just closed the door and allowed him to attack himself, when he's 16 years old, what lies would he now believe of himself? In my house, Papi fights lies. Mommy fights lies. Because we protect our children spiritually. Not perfect, but we're fighting. Now, here's a tool. When in 2011, I was hired uh, by the state to work at, at a group home nearby, and they hired me to be a dad to 11 teenage boys. <laughs> Ooh, and the stories. And, and I was a kid, and they, they hired me to help raise kids. God's crazy, right? <laughs> and, and while I was there, I really was made aware of just how much drama our, kid, our teenagers face <laughs> and how many disciplinary conversations you have to have with a teen. Almost like every 15 to 20 minutes, I was, all right, bro, sit down. Let's talk about, let's talk about what you did wrong. <laughs> and, and then the, the state hired a behavior specialist to come alongside me, which was one of the greatest things in the world. And one of the things that she told me, I'll never forget it, because I was like, I just, I keep telling these kids what they're doing wrong. Like, they, they don't get it. What's wrong with them? And her words were, you need to try the four to one. Like, the four to one? Come on, this is not basketball. Like, what are you talking about, defense? Like, no. <laughs> she said, you need to try the four to one ratio. And here's what she helped me see. She helped me see this four to one ratio of basically dropping four things of encouragement before one challenging thing. Because what she exposed to me in that four to one ratio was that as I come to these kids, here's the news flash. Teens, even children know this. They know what they've done wrong. Like, we, we almost feel like I have to let you know that F's in school is bad. I have to let you know that seven hours on your video game makes you lazy. No, they know they're lazy. They know they're wrong. They know that they need to come out of this. So the last thing they need is to be reminded of it and only it. So the four to one ratio is basically being able to come to your child at whatever stage they're in. Baby, infant, elementary, middle school, high school, out of your house. And being able to almost slowly wean them into the challenge. Because that's not crushing. That's not deflating. Because what we do sometimes is we come in as the discourager, as the crusher, hoping to bring them out of it. Visualize it like this. Every time you have to have a challenging conversation with your child, they're in a ditch. And they're in this massive hole. And your job as a spiritual protector, as a physical protector, is to get them, help them get out of that hole. Is it helpful to say only, hey, you're in a hole. Hey, did you know that? idiot or is it man look at your hands and how strong you are man remember the time you got yourself out once man look at your feet dig them into the ground and pull yourself out man you know what here's a shovel i am your spiritual protector i am your parent i'm gonna help you get out instead of get deeper parents we're here to protect from themselves and this is hard, and, and encouragement is hard, and, but it's super helpful. And in a lot of ways, we need to realize that we as parents, and there's a, there's a phrase that's always said, it's said in everything. I'm going to say it right now, and you guys will, oh, yeah, yeah. It takes a what to raise a child? Let's try it again. It takes a village. village. Now, that is so true. And parents of kids who are adults now and raising their own kids, you're like, yeah, if it wasn't from Fulano down the street who helped me, if it wasn't for these people, it takes a village, yes. But here is the truth. Every village needs an army. The village cannot withstand itself. The, will the village is in need of people who are signed up and saying, I'm ready to help protect, sir. What's needed? So point number two. Tool number two in protecting our children from themselves is Christian community. If you believe for a second that you can do this all by yourself, you need to understand that you are ignorant 
to the task that's before you. You need other people who are like-minded, who love Jesus, who are trying to figure out life just like you. You need more examples than just you. You need more examples than just your, your parents. You need more examples than just other family members. You need an army. Here in this church, there's an army here. In our kids' ministry, there's over 125 adults that have said, sign me up for duty, I'm here to fight and protect. There are over 40 adults in our student ministry that have said, sign me up from duty, I'm here to protect and be with these parents and fight for their kids as well. And many of us say, ah, oh, that's nice. it's not a big deal. And then we're surprised. And we're surprised when kids are wayward, when the kids are following the examples of Drake, when they're following the examples that they see on TV because we haven't put them in a place where there's more. Imagine a child growing up knowing 30 other married couples that aren't family, that aren't their parents, that are like-minded, that love Jesus and trying to figure it out. Imagine a child growing up in that kind of environment where they are connected into a community, what kind of spouse would that be? A child who has many examples of what kind of, what a man looks like or what a woman looks like or what a marriage looks like or what a mother looks like. Being connected into Christian community is one of the biggest things that we can give our children and protecting them from themselves. I can't even tell you the amount of conversations our student ministry leaders are having with teenagers, where you're just watching them, just protecting these children from themselves. It's amazing. Some of you are plugged into this church and you come here, but you're not seeking to fully connect, and you need to know you're missing out. This needs to be a priority. Not a sport, not an activity, but community. And this is not like a church growth thing, but this is real. That's what's been real in my life. The Christian community that I was connected to early on literally rescued me from myself. And I'm seeking to do the same in my children because I can't do it alone. My children need examples. And they also need my example. So that brings us to the last point. See, because the reality is that we we, a lot of times, we're really good. We're so good. I'm actually really good at this. I can tell you everything my children need to say sorry for. <laughs> Bro, I'm like the best. <laughs> like, I can actually write a book. I mean, just yesterday, my little son, he, he pooped himself, and we're sitting there watching a movie, and it smells like poop. I'm like, did you poopy? He said, no. I see it, man. <laughs> it's coming out. <laughs> but... uh <laughs> It's nasty too. But <laughs> the reality is that we're so good at really pointing out what's, what's flawed in our children. And, uh, and we think a lot of times, and just to step away from that a little bit, we think honestly that Christianity is celebrating Christmas. We think Christianity is going to church. We think Christianity is knowing a bunch of rules. We think Christianity is really coming to a place where it's like, I have a, a necklace that has a fish, my car has a fish. Christian, hoorah, yeah. But here's what a Christian really is. A Christian is a repented person. A Christian is somebody who says, I was wrong. I need Jesus. A Christian is someone saying, man, I was in sin. I'm sorry. Jesus, help me. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is not a political party. A Christian is not someone who just argues. A Christian is not someone who knows a bunch of stuff. A Christian is a repented person. Somebody who is willing to look at themselves and say, this is wrong, and it needs a change. And I need a savior. I need someone outside of myself to help me change. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just, oh, I raised my hand, now I'm a Christian. No, it is a life of repentance. Daily repenting. L listening to your spouse and hearing what they say and being like, yeah, you're right, that was wrong. A Christian's a repenter. And what we don't do as parents, or what we need to be doing more of, is helping our children see our sin and protecting our children 
from our sin. See, because here's what protecting our children from our sin means. As parents, we want so bad to be our children's hero. We want to walk in a room and have our children believe there is nothing wrong with mommy or Bobby. We want our children to think, yo, this person's perfect. Were your parents perfect? What sin did you see in your parents? What sin hurt you from your parents? Your child sees your sin. Your child knows where you struggle. Your child knows where you're falling apart. And what they don't need is a perfect parent. What they need is a perfect example of a repentant parent. Of a parent willing to sit and say, hey, look, I was wrong. So a few weeks ago, I had a moment where, you know, I disciplined my son in a way that it was wrong. I need to be better with him. And in the heat of the moment, you know, you get carried away. And, and afterwards, I sat with my son. And it wasn't a conversation of, let me tell you what you did wrong. It's like, Papa, let me tell you what Bobby did wrong. For point number one, we need to be people who are willing to address our sin. To look our child in the eyes and say, let me tell you what was wrong about what you saw. Let me tell you what was wrong about what you heard. Let me tell you what mommy or daddy did wrong. Imagine if you called your child in college and said, hey, look, I've never told you that this was wrong. I'm calling to repent to you. And it's not just addressing it to your child. It's not just addressing it to your teen. It's not just addressing it to your adult. But it's repenting of it. It's being willing to say, hey, look, it was wrong. I'm sorry. You shouldn't have seen me in that way. You shouldn't have heard me do that thing. You shouldn't have felt that for me. That was wrong. But then, getting to that point is huge, right? Addressing it, repenting of it, that's massive. Imagine if our parents did that to us with some circumstances. Imagine getting a phone call from your mom or dad, and it's not them trying to put you down, but it's them trying to say, hey, look, I was wrong that one time. I'm sorry. And as I was having this conversation with my kid, with my son, as I was having this, holding his little cute hands and he's crying because it was just like one of those moments where he was just like, his little heart was overwhelmed with emotion. I'm saying, look, Papo, this shouldn't happen again. But I'm not the hero. Jesus is the hero. You want to pray with Papi so that Jesus can rescue me from this? Like Spider-Man rescues the girl from everything? Jesus wants to rescue me from my sin. So I held my little son's hands and we prayed. We prayed for his papi's sin and for Jesus to help my sin. What would it look like for parents who struggle with drinking to look at their children and say, man, let's, I don't want this no more. Can we just pray together for this? Can we pray for wisdom? Can we pray for God to give me strength to come out of this? What would it look like for a parent to be so transparent with their teen or young adult that they are exposing the fact that a Christian is a repenter? A Christian is somebody who seeks to be rescued by God. I've talked to many teenagers who say, hey man, look, I can't follow Jesus because I'm not perfect. And they've bitten onto a lie that they've seen, oh, to be a Christian, it means to be perfect. When we live in this kind of way, we're freeing our child to not feel like they just have to be something we're not even. Give another example with this, and now I'll come to a story that closes. A few weeks ago, my son, we're talking about superheroes, and Angel's like, Bobby, we're good guys, right? We're the good guys, Garcia boys. We have this little chant we do, and we're good guys. And as I was talking to him, I realized, wait, no. This is a moment. No, Angel, we're not good guys. We were bad guys. And we were broken, and we were bad guys on bad paths. And, but Jesus, the ultimate good guy, reached into Papi's heart. And he's transforming Papi's heart so I can continue and so I can become a good guy like he is. 
He's the chief good guy, and your papi is following after him. And son, I can't wait for you to one day do the same with me. And Jesus is not fighting bad guys. He's rescuing us, the bad guys. And that's what makes us so beautiful. So a few, a few years ago, I had a conversation with a buddy of mine. I'll close with this. Uh, he was talking about his boss. He, one day he got an email from his boss, and he's like, oh, no, what's this email about? And the email was his boss at his Fortune 500 company saying to him, the CEO of the company saying, hey, man, look, I'm going out with some friends to go play golf. I want you to come play with me. And, and his friend, and he's like, oh, my gosh, how crazy is this? And he, we're talking about this. like, bro, I don't play golf. I'm terrible. <laughs> and he's like, man, I'm Puerto Rican. We don't do this stuff. And then golf is not our thing. Basketball, that's what we do, but not that. And so I'm like, well, what are you going to do? He's like, oh. So we start YouTubing videos in, in the middle of our breakfast. Like, all right, so this is a golf club. This is a ball. This is how this works. He's like, I can't go play golf with my boss and do terrible. And he had five weeks. And so he goes ahead, and we spent the five weeks, every time we got together, watching videos together. I almost became like his coach. And I don't know anything about golf, but he was desperate. And so he goes out. He buys these golf clubs, buys the clothes, buys the cleats, spends hundreds of dollars on all this stuff for golfing. Goes and kills it. Does a great job of his boss. Comes to me. He's like, man, it was awesome, bro. I was good. I killed it. Man, we did a great thing. High five. Yeah, men rule. Wow, wow, wow. Right? And then a few months later, we're having a conversation about his daughter. He's like, bro, I just can't connect with her. Oh, she doesn't want to go shopping. <sighs> bro, all she wants to do is talk about feelings. I already do it with my wife. Now I got to do it with her now? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and as I was talking to him, a light bulb came on. I said, man, you were willing to do it for your boss because it was financial gain. And you felt financial gain was more worth than relational gain with your child. You were willing to face discomfort. You were willing to enter something that you're not used to, enter something that's hard for you because it meant a higher paycheck potentially. But you're not willing to do the same if it means a stronger bond and if it means protecting your daughter spiritually. Parents, what we do matters. What we do is serious. Your child, your child's protection spiritually, it's worth you being uncomfortable. It's worth you downloading apps. It's worth you watching YouTube videos. It's worth you fighting for the cause of helping your child not be destroyed by themselves. Parents, don't be the kind of parents that 20 years from now, you wish you did everything we said today. Let me go ahead and pray for us. God, thank you so much for the way that you love us. Thank you so much for the grace and the goodness that we have in you. God, I thank you for the freedom that we get to celebrate in you. God, that we can look at areas that need to grow, that we can look at sin in our life, and there's a hope in it. And it's you. God, that we don't have to just look at ourselves and condemn ourselves and feel crushed, but yet we can look at ourselves and see you, the one who rescues us, the one who frees us from ourselves, the one who frees us from our sin, the one who teaches us how to love our children. God, thank you for being so good to us, that we don't have to sit and soak in our guilt, but yet we can turn our attention to you, the rescuer. Will you rescue our parenting, Lord? Rescue the way we re parent our kids. Restore it. Bring it to a place. We enter our kids' lives as protectors of their souls. Because, God, we know that you know protecting the soul means protecting the body. So, Lord, please continue to set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.